A few weeks ago, I planted a veggie garden in my yard. And that's just on three weeks of growth. So in the mornings, I go and I water it there. And I just have some time with the Lord, okay? So there's four patches in my yard. And um, you'll see the one right at the, there's another one right at the back here. You see it's got bigger gaps. So this morning I was watering there and I was just having a time with the Lord. And uh, I saw the one patch is not growing like the other one. I give it exactly the same amount of water. When we dug it, it had exactly the same amount of fertilizer. There was just something different about that patch. And then the third patch we planted, but only five plants grew. Same size. There's about 100 uh, spinach plants there. Same size, same ground, same soil, same water, same everything. That one died. There's five little ones growing there. And I'm like, Lord, what, what's going on here? So the Lord said, but you named this one. This specific one I named Kenneth's Patch. <laughs> the other one, Peter's wife is here. Peter's not here this morning. We named Peter's Patch. And the other one was Thomas's Patch. So when I showed my wife this this morning, she said, oh, you better not say things like that because people will be offended. Let me tell you something. My patch has got heads like this. Peter's has got a little bit smaller. At one stage I thought, he thought I'm not watering it to have like a competition. (laughs) And the other guy's is dead. And I'm like, Lord, what's going on here? He said, but you named them. You named your seed here. When we're planting it, I said, this, Peter, this is yours. I won't say his name, the other guy's name, and my name. <laughs> Thomas, okay. <laughs> Monday morning, Thomas is going to be upset with me. But listen to this. Peter's only sort of recently he's been saying, you know what, I want to serve the Lord. I, I feel I need to go back to church. And his is growing and there's, there's produce there. It's growing. But I've been in this, I'm not going to call it this, I've been doing my business for the Lord longer than Peter. And I can see by that growth there, it's just sprouting, man, it's amazing. I'm so excited about it. I sent pictures, you know, the ladies, when you have a baby, you send pictures around. I sent to my mom and sister, check, check my patch. I've been eating. I'll bring some for you guys. You're going to pay though. And, and Thomas has got five little things there. And it's just so perfect to what the word of God says. My Bible says that God gives you the seed to sow. And where you sow your seed. And I had a picture of somebody standing there with a little patch of soil and they're watering it. And nothing's coming up because they've sown nothing. And they, they're expecting a harvest. They're looking at my one and saying, I want what Kenneth's got. I, I want what he's got. I want the blessings that he has. But they've never sown. But you're watering. Hey, something's going to happen and the weeds are coming, boy. The weeds are coming, you think it's green. I wonder what's underneath there. And that is a perfect picture of life. Now, I'm not saying that I'm more blessed than Peter because Peter's harvest is coming, it's just smaller. Thomas has got little five things. I'm, I'm actually trying to get these things to grow because I don't want them to die as well. I said, I don't want to break this guy's heart. So I've been putting a little bit of extra things there just to try and help it. But the fact is this, and I want to teach the young people this. If you start to sow now, you will have a harvest. I mean, I've had this new saying that I've been saying to my wife. I say to her, I'm surprised that you are surprised. She'll say, look, look what this guy's done. I'm surprised that she's surprised. Nothing surprises me anymore. You know, young people, if you're going to sleep with each other, 
Things happen. There's babies that happen. There's STDs that happen. There's stuff that happens. What happens is they say to me, Pastor Kenneth, this girl's pregnant. I can't believe it. You sowed a seed. The seed grows. I'm surprised that you surprised. I'm surprised that when people are living together, not married, and there's things going wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm like, hey, Pastor Kenneth, I can't understand. I'm surprised that you're surprised. I'm surprised when a young girl sits here crying, oh, he left me. I don't know what I did wrong. Did you sleep with him? That's what you did wrong. I'm surprised that you're surprised. Pastor Kenneth, did you see what uh, Julius Malema said? I'm surprised that you're surprised. I'm surprised at another thing. That you expect a harvest where you've never sown. Where you don't sow, you don't grow. Finish and clear. You see, a lot of times... There's, there's some people in the church that tackle me on stuff. Pastor Kenneth, you must speak on giving. No. I don't want to teach you to give. I don't want to teach you to feel, yeah, I better give there. Because if you're giving with that type of heart, go spend it on yourself. I want you to have a heart that when you see what's happening here, you go, wow. I want to sow in that place because there's a harvest coming here in 20 years time that you don't see right now. There's young people, I go through our photos. There's little boys this size in my photos. They're sitting here as men today. They're men and they're standing up for what they believe. Not all of them. Some of them are still trailing. We've had two guest speakers here in the last two weeks. The one guy spoke two weeks and then yesterday we had Pastor Rocky. Remember Rocky that preached here? He came and taught my youth. Both of them said, I can't believe the answers I got and the questions I got. He says, these kids know what they're talking about when it comes to the kingdom of God. Okay. Guess what? They see that I've planted in you. That when I'm dead, I'll still reap the rewards in heaven. Okay. That's why I sow here. I can go sow other places. There's a lot of places that love to have me. I don't know if they take dot, but they love to have me. <laughs> dot, please, supper tonight, please. <laughs> Listen, Dot gave a powerful word last week. A powerful word because it's from her heart. When she got up here, she did what I do a lot. Because sometimes I get up here and I, I'm like, Lord, I have, I have nothing. You're going to have to help me. She did the same thing. Because weeks before that, she was like, oh, I don't know if I should. Till that morning, I was saying, must I prepare something? Because she, I don't know if I'm going to talk. After the third song, she said, okay, I'll do something. She got up here and she spoke into the heart of people. And I wonder if any one of you had to just come up here now. And speak. Afterwards, people will say to me, wow. Do you know what it is? It's the presence of God in that person's life. It's the working of God in that person's life. Let me tell you, there's testimonies sitting here. When I heard the woman's testimonies here, there's so much power that's happening there. And sometimes you come to church, you want power from me. I hope he brings a revelation word. There must be power. Listen, you've got that. You have it within you. Each one of you. Somebody said to me, they don't trust someone without a limp. Does that make sense? That means they don't trust someone that hasn't been through something. They don't trust somebody that hasn't toiled and, and taken the word of God and said, Lord, but your word says. They don't trust that person. Until that person's been through something, how can you teach me anything? All of you here have something to teach. All of you. These youngsters, some of them have been through hard times. I'm telling you now, your hard times has prepared you for good times coming. Okay, don't despise the hard times. Don't do that. If you've chosen wrong in marriage and you're having hard times, I don't know what to advise you. But prayer works. Prayer works. 
So I wanted you to go to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Remember last week? It was the week before I had a, a word that said, Now is the time to build, the Lord says. Even in this time that you see destruction and the world looks on and they see destruction and death, now is the time to build in this land, says Almighty God. Do you remember that word? 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man, the unbelieving man, does not accept the things or the teachings or the revelations of the Spirit of Almighty God. For they are foolishness, absurd illogical to him. And he is incapable of understanding them because they are spiritually discerned. And his mind is unqualified to discern or judge. That's in the Amplified Bible. If you're looking at me strange, you got the King James. There's a few words in there. So what the Bible is saying is this. The teachings that I teach from here, if you don't know the Spirit of God, you're going to look at it and say, Amen, that guy... I don't know. He said some stuff I don't understand. The Bible speaks about a, a mature a spiritual Christian. We have some youngsters that are so spiritually mature, they grasping this stuff, they're eating it, and they're putting it into practice in their life. Let me ask any of these kids here, have I ever disciplined any of you here? Put your hand up if I've disciplined you. Put your hand high. Put both hands up. Any here, put your hands up. Put them high. Come, Gracie. Yeah. Come here. Put your feet up as well. Okay. You see, the natural man will say, who does he think he is? Who does he think he is to speak to that child like that? Who does he think he is to bring correction in anybody's life here? Any grown-ups mean... Don't put your hands up, guys. Okay, the correction I gave you was I was sowing seed into your life. At the time that you got that, because I know sometimes you look at me like, hey, hey, you were ugly to me, eh? When you're older, you're going to do exactly what I've done with your kids. You will never forget that. Okay, so when you come dressed to church and I say, don't do that. No, it looks smart. Okay. <laughs> When, when the word of God comes through and you feel in your spirit, but the, I, I, I'm not happy with this word or the word of God that is coming through, I'm, it's agitating me. You need to take that word of God, go and double check it. And if you don't agree with it, come back to me and say you in error. That's what the word of God is. That's what almighty God expects from us. So let's go on. 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, for who has known the mind and the purpose of the Lord? So as to instruct him. He's asking who here knows the mind of God that you can tell him what to do? It says this, but we have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Do you know one of the scriptures that freaked me out the most? The Bible says this. It says that the spirit is subject to the prophet. In other words, what happens is this. The Holy Spirit can come and tell you to do something. He can unction you. He can say to you, listen, don't do this. This is not good for you. And you, as the prophet of God, can say, I'm, 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 I'm going to do this. He can unction you. He can say to you, listen, go to Pastor Kenneth and tell him this. And you can say, no, no, I'm not doing that. He can see you going to fall or he's going to see that you're going into a place where you shouldn't be and he can be convicting you in your heart and, and just bringing this in and saying, don't go there, don't go there. And you can say, no, I'm going. That's how gentle the Spirit of God is. So how do you have the mind of Christ? It's because the Spirit of God is living in you that when you start thinking these ugly things, he's telling you, no. Has anybody had that in their life? Where you know, listen, I'm going to go do this thing, but Almighty God doesn't want me to do this. But guess what? It's for good as well. He can be unctioning you saying, do this good thing. And you can say, not today, Lord. You could be walking down the road and there can be somebody that's worse off than you. And he can be saying, take the 20 rand you have in your pocket and give it to that person. And you're going, no, nah, I need it. I need it. 
I have this friend. His name's Johnny. He runs, I think, 20 to 30 home cells. He said to me one day he was in church. He had enough money to put petrol in his car, buy a loaf of bread, and some Viennas for his family for supper. Then his money was finished for the week. That was a Sunday evening. He said, and the money that was in his pocket, I think was about 150, 180 rand, when petrol was still cheap. He said, the Lord said to him, go to this man that's sitting in front of the church and give him the money that's in your pocket. And he went and he looked and he saw, the man that was sitting there is a multi, multi millionaire. He said, Lord, I'm not going to do that. And the, he says he never heard a song. He didn't hear what the pastor said. The Lord was saying to him, go give him the money. Go give him the money. Go give, just go and give him the money. Go give him the money. And he says, before the service was over, he thought, I'm going to get in my car and leave you. I can't handle this. He was walking out. And as he walked out, this guy was also leaving early. And there his opportunity was. And he thought, he took the money out and he walked up to him and he said, listen, I just got to do this. And he says he couldn't even look in the guy's eyes because he felt so embarrassed that he was giving this multimillionaire this 180 rand. He took his hand and he said, yeah, put it in. I have to go. And the guy followed. He said, no, no, come here, come. He said, no, no, I can't talk to you. This guy ran after him. And he said, listen, stop here. I need to talk to you. He said, here's 5,000 rand. The Lord told him, somebody will give you 180 rand today. The man that gives you the 180 rand, bless him with the 5,000. Okay. Sometimes the Lord's going to ask you to do stuff that you think is so stupid. You're going to think, I don't want to do that. And it can change your life. It can turn your life around. 12 years ago, I went to the Hamlet school. And I was standing there, I was walking around, not the big Hamlet, the little Hamlet. They ranged from six years to 20. And they were having a fight there. And as I walked in there, I had a feeling in my heart that I wanted to do preach in that school. It was a goal of mine. And remember, I hadn't preached in any school. I said, Lord, I, I feel I want to preach here. So I went and got in my car and the Lord said to me, go stand in the middle of the soccer field and wait. I was driving the car, I thought, no man. He said, go to the soccer field and wait. And by that time I had already driven out. When I went back, somebody took and taken my parking. So I had to park, and gone four blocks up and walk back. I walked back, I went and stood in the middle of the soccer field. There's all people around, I'm al standing alone there. Feeling a little bit like a mampara, I'm just, <laughs> yo. And this lady out of the corner of my eye comes walking to me like this. She says, the Lord sent me. Do you want to preach here? There's Dot, you can ask her. I said, yes. She says, this principle doesn't just let anybody preach here. I'll arrange it for you. So the next Friday morning, they phoned me the Monday, can you come? I said, I'll be there. And I dressed like this. Actually, I was dressed in a t-shirt. But that morning, a friend of mine, which is a dentist, phoned me and said to me, I, I just have a feeling I must go with you this morning. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to sp speak at a school. Now, if you see this guy, he wears those jeans with the holes. Looks like he got them. He was attacked by a dog or something. And he combs his hair like this. And Corey phoned me. He said, listen, where are you going this morning? I'm, I've got a morning off. I said, I'm going to school. He says, I'll go with you. He pitches up in shorts and Crocs. <laughs> we get there. The principal standing in a three-piece suit. He says, I do my thing. He says, can you come to the office? We sit down. He says, I don't go for this rubbish. He says, if you want to speak in my school, you will wear a suit. You will never speak here again. As he says that, my dentist friend's phone rings. He says, excuse me, can I take this? The guy looks at him, but now he doesn't know he's a dentist. And he says, 
Yes, book her for, I'll be there at 12 o'clock, book her for a root canal. Okay, bye-bye. He says to him, what work do you do? He says, I'm a dentist. A dentist? He says, he says can't you just look here, please? <laughs> so now, all of a sudden, this guy's softening. Then Corey's phone rings. Yeah, hello. Yeah, now I'll be there. I'm not working today. Uh, ask Captain so-and-so. He says, what work do you do? He says, I'm a policeman. This guy looked at us like this. We had breakfast, we had some sandwiches, and we left. Two weeks later, Hi, Pastor Kenneth, can you please come preach at my school? This is Dr. Oscar. I get there. The principal is dressed like me. <laughs> have I right, Dot? I have such a long-standing relationship there. All the time I'm there. That man's life changed. God did something. But it took me to go and park my car four blocks up, not feeling like it, thinking, Lord, really? You stand in the middle of a, a rugby field? Really? Maybe the Lord's asking you today to do something different. Maybe he's asking you to take this idea that when you sow a seed, it's not just a financial thing that's happening in your life. You might, the Lord might be asking you to go to somebody and say to that somebody, listen, this is what the Lord's telling me. I never forget one day. I just started here. The Lord said to me, go down to this pastor and tell him that you see his life is off the tracks. I was like, no ways. That pastor, they got a big church. So there's no ways I'm going to do that. There's no ways. He said, I'm telling you, go do that for me. I didn't want to do it. So I left it. I thought, I'm not doing it. We have, somebody phones me, Pastor Kenneth. We're having a pastor's prayer meeting. Can you come? I said, yes, I'll be there. I get there and guess who's sitting there. <laughs> so now, the Lord says, I want you to stand up loud and tell this man. I want you to leave. In the end, I stood up, I said, my brother, I don't know how to tell you this, but the Lord shows me a railway track, and your train's off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Today, he's back on track. But he started, in his ministry, it was so tough, he started drinking. He would go home and beat his wife. He stepped down from ministry from that. I'm telling you, because I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, but is my life on track? If I got it together, how can I tell this guy? You go read your Bible, there's many places that the Lord even used children to reprimand grown people. So I'm asking you now, when you hear the Spirit of God speaking to your life, go and give somebody something. You know, even if you're going to give into this ministry, go before the Lord and say, Lord, do you want me to give there? Don't just say, oh, well, I have to give. Because then you, you're sowing seed, you're going to water there and wonder why nothing's growing. You have to give into fertile soil where you know Almighty God is going and name your seed. Say, Father, I'm sowing into the tower because I see something is happening there. There's youth there. There's little ones there. They're growing. You see, if you're just going to give yourself, well, the Lord says, I have to. You've wasted your seed. You see, it's a precept. It's one of those things that if you do it, the Bible says it will work. But do it in the right place. Sow it in the right place. How much time have I got? I don't my wife spoke so long last week. It says this in Proverbs 16 verse 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. He is your partner in everything you do. Every job you're looking for, every business you're looking for, every little grain of seed and sand that you're going to sow, everything you're going to dig up and plant, he is there. Young ladies, young men, if you're looking for a husband, go to the Lord first and ask him, Lord, show me the man. You choose the man. You, you too young girl. She just turned 16 on Saturday, Friday. Okay. 
Happy birthday to you. So listen to this. Galatians 6 verse 7. I'm going to read from the Amplified. It says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He will not allow himself to be ridiculed nor treated with contempt. Nor allow his precepts to be scornfully set aside. For whatever a man or woman sows, this and only this will they reap. If you're sowing nothing, you get nothing. If you're sowing nonsense, if you're sowing aggression, unforgiveness, discord, anger, bitterness, Okay, we've, we've spoken a lot about the woman. Let's speak about the men. <laughs> Anger. Pride. <laughs> My Bible says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What is pride? Pride is when you think you're better. When you think you're better than your wife. When you think you're better than anybody because they've got pink skin and brown skin. Have you seen this thing in South Africa? Black and white. I don't know many black people. I know brown people. I know pink people. Caramel people. Black and white. I've never seen it. Listen. When you think you're better than your spouse, you think because I'm the man, I'm the stronger one, you've got a big problem. Big problem. Woman, the man is the head of the house. Give that back to him. Because if you're trying to take to be the head of the house, Lulu, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Give that place back to him. If he makes mistakes with that place, it's up to him. You can say, Lord, I pray for him. But there's so many women that want that place because they want control. They want to be the boss. And you want to know why your life and your family is falling apart. It's your fault. Men, stand up and take that place. My wife is a very, very dominant type of personality. She's older than me. She's had good experience in life. She's a good businesswoman. It's very, very difficult for me to be the head of the house. But I am. You guys see me here, soft, gentle, jokey, Pastor Kenneth. But when it comes to the house, I have to make the final decisions. And if they're wrong... She, her job is to say, Father, please sort my husband out. Sort your son out. My job is to pray for my wife, but it's also Almighty God's daughter. So my Bible says this. If I'm not honoring my wife, my God closes off. He puts a wall. He doesn't hear my prayers. Husbands, if your prayers are not being answered, check how you're treating your wife. Young men. Young men. If you're treating women like they're just a piece of meat, those prayers are shot. You can pray until you're blue in the face. Look, I'm pink. If I pray, I can go blue in the face. You can pray until you're darker in the face. Nothing's going to happen. Young men, the way you treat women, don't expect Almighty God to bless you if you're treating his daughter like a piece of meat. Maybe on our men's conference, we need to tackle that thing. What you sow, the way you treat a woman, you are sowing. My God will not be mocked the way you treat his daughters. The way you treat your wife, the way you treat the one that you think is going to be your wife. Don't come there and think to yourself, well, I'm just the sexy guy, I'm the cool guy, I can just have them. You are heading for destruction. There's a pity there's not men, more men here. The Bible says, honor your mother and father and it will be well with you for longer days. You dishonor your mother and your father, you will have problems. Ah, uh, PK, you don't know what my mother did to me, you don't know what my father did. I don't care what they've done. Find something to honor about them. Find something. Look at yourself and see how you're behaving. Maybe if you change your behavior, they might start treating you differently. Maybe if you started listening, they might treat you differently. Maybe if you started behaving, they might treat you differently. Am I nagging? <laughs> I want to tell you, 
Every word that you speak is a seed. Every thought that you have is a seed. Guys, start thinking clean. Start prophesying over yourself. Look in the mirror. Don't look at your shortfalls. See what God wants to do with you. You know, I don't know if you can see, I've got some pimples on my neck and face here. I was looking in the mirror and I laughed. I said, Lord, you really want me to connect with the teenagers. I feel like a teenager. Listen, I know what it's like to get up here and think you are. Yesterday I wore closed neck because I was embarrassed by this. I know what it's like to have a pimple on your nose and go to a meeting. Seed. What are you sowing? What did you sow this week? Did you sow discord? What did you speak to your wife? What did you say to your friend? What did you say about somebody? For the older people, I hope you're getting this because I'm speaking to the young ones here. But you need to grasp it as well. If you're living together and you're not married, you're sowing some problems there. How do you know? Because that's how I lived with my wife. Till somebody came to me and said, this is not right. You know what I did? They said, why are you living? It's not right. I said, marry me now. There's my wife, ask her. We couldn't get a witness. The next Saturday we got married. If he wants to sleep with you now, tell him, put the ring. Because if he's not good, if he can't wait for you now, what happens when you've had a two-year-old, your hips are bigger, okay? The hair's not so nice because you don't have time to go to the salon and you've put on a bit of... And all of a sudden, another young one comes and he can't say no to her. If he can't say no to you, how is he going to say no to her? If he says, I can wait for you, my darling, that's the one. If he can't wait, it means he will wait for no one. And then we can throw that to the girls as well. They know what I'm talking about. That's why they're giggling. But it's truth. It's truth. Can we close our eyes? Father, in your, in your word, in the book of Haggai, there's a script in Haggai 1 verse 7, I think it is, Lord. Your word says that you live in nice houses, ordained with all good things, but yet my house lays in ruins. Lord, we sow into our own lives. We'll buy things for ourselves, but yet your house lays in ruins. How can it be, Father God, that you bless somebody, and yet they will not bless somebody else? They will not sow a seed. Yet your word says, I give. Almighty God gives the seed to the sower. It's one of your precepts. It's one of your promises that when you sow, when you give, I will bless you. So Father, I pray into the spirit of the people in this congregation that they start to become those people that look at their seed and say, have I sown here? And Father, perhaps there's many here this morning that have sown into evil. They've done evil things. They've played with false gods. They've slept around, and now they're realizing, but I've sown seed into places that is evil. That means I will reap evil. But my God, your word says that you are my redeemer. That if we confess our sins, you are able and just to forgive us of our sins. That if we repent and turn from our evil way, you will then come in and heal us, Lord. So right now, Father, as their hearts are shifting and turning and you're speaking to their hearts. Perhaps there's something they did many years ago and they forgot about it, but they're reaping of that now. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray they open their hearts to you and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me for the way I treat that person. Forgive me the way I treat that woman, my God. Forgive me, Lord. And Lord, perhaps we've sown seed in the world. In our youth, we may have sown into places that are very evil without realizing it. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. And Father, as we leave here, Lord, your word says, you never leave us nor forsake us. 
You are always with us. What we see, you see. Where we go, you go. Father, there's some places that we take you that you should never be able to see. You should never ever be going into those places, but yet we think it's okay to go there, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. Perhaps this morning you, you, you sit in there thinking, my, my life is not where it should be. Maybe there's stuff that you've done and you, you sit in thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Father, right now, you know the heart of man, every woman, every child in this place, you know their hearts, Lord. I pray right now they draw closer to you, Lord. That it won't just be a Sunday thing, but every single day they will get up and say, Lord, I give my day to you. Help me, guide me. In Jesus' holy name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen.